If what you want to do is put a disc in a drive and play it on your computer, you're going to want any DVD and VLC player. There you go. Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about what to do if you have yourself one of these 4K discs, one of these 4K friendly drives, or even one of these official Ultra HD drives, but you do not have yourself one of these, which is any Intel processor from the 6th to 10th generation. So even if you have one of these, which happens to be a third generation i7, you can still watch and use your 4K discs, although it doesn't really like it too much. You know, the whole 4K not being supported on the hardware itself is kind of a problem in this case. But anyway, if you wish to possess this kind of power, this is the video for you. However, I have to make some things clear right from the start. First of all, I'm not an attorney. I'm certainly not your attorney. And even if I were, I'm probably not an attorney for the entire planet. One of the things that slowed the production of this video down dramatically is when I started looking into everything, I very quickly came to the conclusion that there are 200 different sets of laws in the world based on the roughly 200 different countries there are in the world. So it's very difficult to talk about this topic in any kind of a realistic detail without potentially getting in trouble in one of those 200 places. It's just a crazy system, especially from the point of view of the laws in America, which is where all of this originated from. The deck is intentionally stacked against the consumer. All the laws were written by the corporations. So we're in a really nebulous place here in the US. Also, just to mention it, I'm not the arbiter of your morality. If you feel you have a moral position to do whatever thing you're going to do, that's fine with me. It's not my business. I encourage you to keep it your own business, including down in the comments. What you might think about the law in a certain place or what you might do in your own house is your own business. I don't want to have to start removing comments or anything. That's not really the kind of channel I like to run. You know, if I do something wrong, you want to call me an idiot, that's fine. Go for it. But we don't want to start getting other people in trouble or, or yourself or whatever in trouble. Let's keep that stuff mum. For that reason, in this video, you're going to have to use a little bit of your imagination and a little bit of make-believe because I will not be using any media that I do not own the copyright to personally. Fortunately for all of us, I've already created the greatest movie to ever exist. Eh. On this disc is just a DVD version of the first segment of this video where we flash the drives. So this is what we'll be using for all of the demonstrations. When necessary, I will just tell you, hey, this thing might be different, or we'll use some make-believe or pull pictures from somewhere or whatever. This is gonna be kind of a long-winded video, and I know that because there's a lot of caveats and this, that's and everything along the way. So I will give you the meat and potatoes right this second. If what you wanna do is put a disc in a drive and play it on your computer, you're gonna want any DVD and VLC player. There you go. Any DVD is not free, VLC player is. I'm going to equip you with a whole lot of other options to go about this as we go on. And we're gonna discuss a lot of reasons why you may not actually wanna do that. But if you're dead set that this is the path you're on, that's what you're gonna do. That's what I would recommend. That might be something I could do if I were to live in a different country. Also, if what you want is to take one of these, drop it into a drive, play it back with no hassles, no problems, whatever, 100% perfect every single time, full menu support, full bonus features, all that good stuff, you don't want this. You want this. Just a good old standalone UHD Blu-ray player. This is like a middle of the road model Sony. It was under $200. It works just fine. It will do all the things I just said that it will do until the day it dies. So if you want the most compatible, least trouble solution, PC playback is not for you. You want one of these. And I say that for a few reasons, but primary among them is this right here. Down here is my traditional 1080 Blu-ray player. This is my 4K player. All Blu-rays and up, as far as I'm aware, so Blu-ray and 4Ks, the, their menus and such run on Java. If you don't know what that is, if you've never heard of it, that's okay. It's an old computer programming language. It's basically one of the more popular like web programming interfaces from 20 years ago. It is no longer supported, and it's a security vulnerability to have it installed on your PC. Plus, through my experimentation, it doesn't really work anyway. Sometimes uh, disk menus and stuff will work with Blu-rays, sometimes they don't. DVDs do not use Java, so they're a little bit more straightforward. If you really want a seamless experience, PC playback is really, really not for you, at least without a whole bunch of hassles, this being primary among them. I should also point out that you won't save any money doing this, instead of doing this by the time you get into it. 
At the time I bought this stuff, this enclosure for this drive was, I think, 50 or 60 bucks. This drive was like 60 or 65. And any DVD varies in price or sales all the time, but it's, we'll say, 100 bucks. That's more than this 4K machine cost. There are plenty of good reasons to go this way instead of this way, but saving money isn't one of them. I also want to take a quick minute to mention that I got a comment from at least one viewer who was someone who is disabled. So the reason they wanted to do PC playback is because, you know, they get around in the morning or in the day or whatever, and then they are just like parked at their computer desk all day. So it's not really an option to, you know, go somewhere else and watch a movie or whatever. So it would just be a nice thing for them to be able to do, which would make one of these maybe a little bit harder for them. What I would say is on a, a lot of setups, you may not have multiple inputs for HDMI and stuff like that on your computer monitor. This little box right here is an automatic HDMI switch, or it, it comes with a little like credit card remote too. These things are about 15 bucks. This particular one passes 4K and HDR and everything else through it. No problem whatsoever. Uh, no copyright protection issues or anything else like it. I'll link this in the description just in case you should happen to be maybe in that situation. And, and that's one of the reasons why you didn't want to go this way because it's just difficult to do with your screen. This takes care of that problem for you. So now you have another choice to make. You take the blue pill and you play discs in a regular player and go about your life, never knowing anything else. Or you take the red pill, and you find out just how deep this rabbit hole goes. Also, it would have been a lot smarter for me to buy a pack of M&Ms than to paint a couple of aspirins. All right, Red Pill Army. Fair use law in the United States allows for content that is educational. Although we will not be broadcasting any copyrighted materials in this video, we are gonna be talking about some of the methods and approaches they've used to establish some of the protections on these copyrights so you understand what you're doing when you do something else. Therefore, time to get a little bit educated so, you know, we all stay in good graces. And plus, you know, you should probably know a little bit about what you're doing, right? So once upon a time in the 1970s, CD Audio was being developed. I would venture that almost everyone watching this video has seen one of these before. This technology predates the ability to duplicate it at a consumer level in any meaningful way. Therefore, they didn't bother to really try and protect it whatsoever. Copyright law does apply to this stuff. However, there is no encryption, no copy protection or anything like that on the source material itself. That is why, for instance, when these things came into being, you know, for anyone under the age of 75, this is an iPod. Steve Jobs was not in prison for the rest of his life for packaging iTunes with the purchase. So you could rip all of these things down to MP3 to put them on here. There was copyright, but not any kind of encryption or anything. So we were not breaking any of those laws by doing this. This was all legit. In many parts of the world, I believe that's how this still is. This technology in the United States predates the DMCA. The iPod doesn't, but CD Audio does. DMCA does all kinds of bad things for the consumer, which I'm not gonna go into any great detail about because again, I'm not an attorney. I only passingly know what I'm talking about, which means I don't know what I'm talking about. So, you know, big grain of salt with all this. But a lot of people have it in their minds that doing this thing to put it on this thing is the same thing as doing this thing to put on this thing. And depending on where you are in the world, that may not be the case. Again, you know, do your own research and all that good stuff. Case in point, the first iteration of any kind of copy protection, encryption, or anything else came about on DVDs. Or at least the first iteration that any of you would have seen before. The people who originally released the software to circumvent this ended up in lawsuits with the studios and there was a bunch of bad nasty threats, a lot of court cases, stuff like that. When you look into this stuff, you don't necessarily see the history behind it, you just see where we're at today. When we got to this point is when the studios started paying attention to what was going on. The very short answer for how this kind of copy protection works is that there are essentially keys on the disc just like you may have keys to your car if you have a vehicle as old as my stuff there's a limited combination of keys that you can make to have different locks that's how dvds work so there's only a few hundred keys for these those keys once upon a time were leaked and ever since then dvds have been unlocked the next iteration would have come on regular old blu-rays this is a 1080 blu-ray not a 4k disc this is where the machines started to learn and started to adapt. The keys on these discs are updated over time. So this is a pretty old disc. It probably has a version of the key from many, many years ago. We'll say that it's number, we'll say that it's version 30 on this disc, though I don't know that. But a much newer disc, including this 4K, may have something like version 90 on it. So what happens here is, if you go to insert this disc in one of these, or one of these, the machines rise 
and update the firmware on these devices by themselves. This happens without your knowledge or consent. So every time a new revision of the encryption keys come out, they release it on a new disk, it then populates your player. So if at any point those keys are ever compromised, they just eliminate a key. So therefore it's then expired and you can't use it. For that reason, these players tend to need to be online, especially Sony players, like it was notorious for PS3s. You'd have to connect your PS3 like once or twice a year just to get new keys from Sony, or else it would defeat all Blu-ray playback, period. So, fun times. You know, the, the slow erosion of your rights as a consumer. The good news is this gets way worse. So in addition to the encryption that came out with Blu-ray discs, we actually ended up with hardware encryption via the HDMI port itself as well. So here I've got the Blu-ray player that Columbus sailed with when he was discovering the new world. On the back of it, you will see that it has an HDMI connector as well as component and composite video out. HDMI is hardware encrypted from end to end. These are not. So if you had the correct equipment, you could actually pull an HD rip out of your component video. Or you can just you know, plug a VCR in and make a really terrible copy of a composite connection. When these things were still being adopted as a newer technology, you know, we were going from DVD to Blu-ray and all that stuff, they still had to offer all of these connections because people had equipment that didn't have them. Like my first HDTV uh, had component connections. It only had one HDMI and it was a terrible connection. You were way better off to use the component back in the day. However, that didn't stop HDMI from proceeding forward as planned. The way this works is it's hardware encrypted from end to end, from device to device, including the cables themselves. So if everything in the chain, meaning your TV, your cables, your player, everything else, doesn't all shake hands and agree, yes, we're officially licensed, blah, 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 it won't play. This could become a problem in a situation where, say, you're using a monitor of the era and not an HD TV, and your monitor has a DisplayPort connector instead of HDMI. DisplayPort is basically royalty-free HDMI. It looks like that. That's a DisplayPort connector. Since DisplayPort is royalty-free, that is another way of saying it's not licensed. It doesn't have all the hardware handshaking that HDMI requires. So if you had a monitor with a DisplayPort connector, you try to plug it into your legally purchased, properly regioned Blu-ray player, and you put in your legally purchased, properly regioned Blu-ray, you could connect all this stuff together and end up in a situation where your completely compatible hardware, meaning it all supports the right resolution and everything else, won't play discs. I don't know if that's really a thing anymore. I don't think I've seen anything with DisplayPort on it in quite some time now. And I don't truly know how bad the compatibility issue was, but it definitely did happen. Then of course, on a long enough timeline, we get into, you know, a more modern player. The only way you're getting video out of this thing is via HDMI. They got rid of all these connections in the name of anti-piracy. I said a few minutes ago, until like uh, a couple years ago, I had a TV where I was still using these. If I wanted to put a four, plug a 4K player into it, I was pretty much screwed. But bah, that's not their problem, that's your problem as the consumer. And now we're back to these guys colluding with these guys and a bunch of other guys, movie studios and whatever else, to bring us what was known as Intel SGX. SGX did for the digital side what HDMI did for the physical side. It hardware encrypts every step along the entire path, including like the RAM. So from one end of the data stream to the other, it's 100% encrypted from the input of you know, whatever you're doing. So we'll, we'll say you're in an encrypted application. So the input might be a keyboard. You press a character. As soon as that character becomes digital from your physical world, it's encrypted all the way through to the screen. That is why if you have a processor that is not Intel SGX capable, you can't watch commercially produced, properly licensed 4K Blu-rays, even if you have an officially licensed drive. So this drive is an Ultra HD drive. It will do all the hardware handshaking with the specific Intel processor and everything else. So this all works, except when Intel said, hey, we're gonna deprecate SGX as a feature, which they did so because it's also a huge security vulnerability, ironically. When Intel announced they were doing that, Microsoft said, hey, we're not gonna support it anymore either. So now if you have certain revisions of Windows, even with officially licensed hardware, which all of this that you're looking at is, you still can't get it to work because Windows doesn't support it anymore. On top of that, let's say by some magic, you have a Windows installation where you have never let it update and it still supports it. The only licensed playback software, which is Cyberlink Power DVD, as far as I know, that's the only officially licensed software there has ever been for this. They stopped supporting it. So they don't support SGX anymore either. So basically everybody in the whole chain no matter how much money you spent on all the right stuff to do this the right way, just basically backed out of the deal. 
So now you've entered this nightmare Willy Wonka world where you get nothing, no matter how much money you spent, how much money you try to spend, how you try and do it right, you no longer can. You're either locked into old hardware and old operating system and old software, which all have security vulnerabilities, which is why the feature set was deprecated to begin with, or you have to go another way. And that other way is unlicensed software. Much in the same way that DisplayPort is unlicensed HDMI, all of the various unlicensed playback software out there does not support the encryption. So those tools sidestep the encryption, or many of them do. So in the case of our friendly Blu-ray drive here that we updated the firmware on so it can read 4K discs, the way the hardware keys on Blu-ray and up work is if the keys don't handshake, the drive won't read the disc. The updated firmware just allows the drive to access the whole disc regardless of whether or not the keys match. This is what Libra drive mode is, which is what Make MKV calls it. So what it really is, is it's the meme of the, you know, the locked gate on a sidewalk with no fence attached to it. So you can just walk right around it. So in the case of the keys, that's what they do there. So now with this drive, you can access the whole disc regardless of anything else. A utility like any DVD is to deal with other encryption algorithms that are employed on you know, all these discs really. And that is the stuff where it becomes really nebulously questionable depending on where you live. So I'm not gonna talk about it a whole lot more, but essentially is that's how it works. The drive can read the 4K disc because you just told it to. You just told it to read the whole disc regardless of what's on it. And the software can play it back because it sidesteps the SGX requirement. And you are in this situation because you have no other option. There's the whole thing front to tail. You, you just simply can't spend any amount of money to make this work as it was initially designed when they came up with SGX. So this system has been constructed so the only person who is expected to play by the rules is you. I'm not a big fan of that personally, so that's why we're here where we are today. And that's also why I felt it was important that you understand this history, at least as well as I understand it, which is to, you know, say, kinda. To just see the erosion of your rights as this has gone on, and to see what has been taken from you in the name of whatever this kind of nonsense is. Uh, for that matter, if you are an AMD customer and you never had an Intel chip to begin with, you could never play 4Ks anyhow. I don't know if certain versions of Windows supported SGX. Like, I don't know if you could have a 6th gen on maybe Windows XP and be able to play a 4K disc. I don't even know if that's a thing. Anyway, they've, they've crippled this for way too long, so let's talk about how to move beyond it. And not just that, why it's important that you might want to. First and foremost, I'm going to make the argument that what you really don't want is to just play back. This is a playback machine. It's great at that. It does that job perfectly. But eventually this machine is going to break down. If I had to take a guess, I would say that this machine, which has just been sitting on a shelf for the last 10 years, probably already has broken down. But I've already lived long enough to have had several DVD players that have given up the ghost. I'm sure this Blu-ray player is not far behind them. Someday this 4K player is gonna join them too. The trouble is, when this one dies, there's probably not gonna be another one that you're gonna be able to go out and buy. 4K UHD discs are going to be the end of the line in optical media. This format was, I would say, widely introduced to consumers approaching 10 years ago. And there have been not even whispers of anything on the horizon that's going to replace it. It's very obvious the studios are pushing full into streaming services. So instead of me buying this disc once for, I don't know, 30 bucks, whatever it costs, I can subscribe to Paramount Plus until my dying breath for 20 bucks a month if I ever want to watch this movie again. If you are interested in these things for all the great many reasons that I think you should be, you're going to have to come to the realization that the day is coming and probably sooner than later that you won't be able to just play them anymore. Another thing that not many people are aware of is that the construction techniques between Blu-ray and 4K and DVD and CD are different. This is a DVD and you can see the previous owner wasn't any too delicate with it. It's got a bunch of scratches in it. This DVD, no doubt, still plays just fine without question. And for that matter, it probably would still rip onto a computer just fine should you live somewhere where you could do such a thing. This disc technology has a relatively thick layer of basically lacquer. It's a polycarbonate sheet that's very, very thick over the data. So even if you have one of these that's really, really bad, you can use a machine like this to clean it up enough for it to be able to be read. So many people, especially people that grew up with these like I do, have a false sense of security for just how durable this media is. A CD, I could just about drag down the sidewalk and still get a computer to read it. 
or get a commercial player to play it, assuming you have a good commercial player still. Not the case once we move along. This is a Blu-ray that was a form, former rental disc. And just right there, you can see it's just got that one tiny scratch in it. Otherwise, this disc looks perfectly fine. This disc will only read in one out of the six Blu-ray drives I have. Just one. Just happens to be that one Asus drive from the previous video will read this disc. All the other ones fail. A set-dot player like this will just skip over the data and will give you like a chunky garbage kind of presentation, but probably still keep playing. Computers don't work the same way. So what'll happen is if you end up with one of these discs that has a small defect in it like that, is that it basically will just quit playing. The software will just stop. So for instance, this disc just, just happens to be SAW1, by the way. If you try to play this in a computer, it would not work out well for you. And unlike DVDs, they have that super thick lacquer layer. On my left is a DVD, and on my right is a Blu-ray. And I think you can actually see just how thick that protective coating is on the DVD. On the Blu-ray, you can't even see it. It basically does not exist. Despite not appearing to be there, these Blu-ray discs very much do still have a coating. It is just remarkably thin, and it's also super, super hard. But once it's scratched, you've got a problem. The actual repair method for damaged Blu-rays is to contact the studio you bought it from and hope with your UPC that they'd be willing to send you a replacement disc. There are some machines and services out there that are very, very expensive that claim to be able to resurface Blu-ray discs, but it's not anything that you really want to get into as a consumer. With 4K discs, there's sometimes another phenomenon that crops up. This is what I'm going to refer to as case rash. No doubt you can see kind of all the goobers built up on the disc. That is actually oil from when the disc was manufactured or when the case was manufactured. This spot right here, I would not be surprised if that was a part of the, one of the suction cups that handled this thing when it was new. You know, this kind of thing is, in my opinion, a degradation in the quality of you know, material and craftsmanship that we're going to continue to experience and likely see accelerate as this media continues to die. By and large, this kind of stuff doesn't damage the discs, but you better believe that if you try to clean that off there the wrong way, you can put a scratch in it like that saw disc I just showed you, and then the disc is hooped. The reason these 4K discs are essentially irreparable is because most of them are at least double layer, if not triple layer. So the laser is not just focusing on that damage one time, it's got to focus through that layer and a third layer and the damage to read the data. And the data on these 4K discs is very, very densely packed. The tracks on them are actually physically much narrower than they are on a standard Blu-ray and definitely more so than a CD or DVD. So these 4K discs are incredibly fragile and that surface is so thin that you, you essentially can't polish them. I have previously had discs in my possession, like my copy of Interstellar here, that physically look pretty much perfect but perhaps would have a few small defects like those little pieces of dust or whatever those are. So I thought it would be a good idea to just take a piece of painter's tape and put on there and try and peel the dust back. I went to peel the tape off, not like a unhinged rabid beast or anything, just peel it off. And I took this top layer of protective film straight off the disc. It just cracked it and peeled it right off with blue painter's tape. Like this disc, for instance, I just bought brand new from Amazon a couple weeks ago. Came to me sealed up. No damage on the packaging or anything. Get my disc out, drop it in the drive, go to play it. Starts making all sorts of bad noises. Flip it over, that is a nice crack. It's not actually all the way through the disc. It's just through this first protective like film layer. So you get stuff like that that can happen uh, without a whole lot of trouble. These discs are a lot more fragile than you think they might be. It's for all those reasons that I believe the future is to completely re-digitize your media back from the physical realm here, take the ones and zeros on those discs and put them on a hard drive, uh, preferably with a backup copy. Of course, only if you live somewhere where that would be allowed. As soon as I could afford one of these, I think in 2005, I pretty much never ever played a CD again. I would buy a CD, it would go in the computer, it would get put onto an iPod and that would be the end of it. They've all been MP3s since then from that day forward. In somewhere where it's legal to do it, that is far and away the preferred method of dealing with your movies as well. It sounds expensive at first. This was expensive at first too. I don't think you can give these things away anymore. I don't think anyone even cares about these. But as time, so as time marches on, your costs will diminish. 
and like most things, you're not going to sit down and do a whole library of these things in five minutes. You'll be doing this for weeks or months to come. So with the whole sermon out of the way, let's get into the nuts and bolts on the computer side of things and show you what needs to be done. It's actually really, really easy if you want to do it the way that I prefer. It gets a lot more complicated if you like doing it in a way that a lot of other people prefer. So moving on to the actual computer portion of our video, I'm going to be using our HP 2250 XT TE01, or maybe that's backward, 11th generation i5 processor that does not have SGX. And we're going to be using just our dirt cheap LG drive that we flashed in one of the prior videos. So all the stuff we're going to be using here is unsupported hardware for official UHD playback. So none of this stuff is supposed to work, but I will show you how to make it work. So there's really only three pieces of software you'll need. One is going to be Make MKV. So I think most people that are here probably already have it. Uh, Make MKV is what enables LibreDrive mode, which everything else tends to need to use. Make MKV is free, quote unquote, while it is in beta. It is always in beta. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, we sign our whole lives away. So f the way I like to do things, I won't actually need to run Make MKV all that much. But other people like to do other things with this that I don't prefer doing that way. But anyway to quote unquote register it. The software is available for sale. Uh, frankly, if you like any of these tools, or, you know, just like if you like any of my videos, you know, you should support the people that make them. So you can buy it, you don't have to though. The way to register it, permanently, temporarily, whatever, or to get your free license. Make MKV is free while in beta. You're gonna find this forum post and the author puts a serial number in there every month or so. They don't necessarily always do it on the first of the month or whatever, so there will be times that your license will be expired and that's just all you can do. And from a fresh install you don't really need to worry about it. But So it actually, so it says that key is good. For me that's only a few days. So I'm not actually going to do that right now because just with a fresh install it'll be good for 30 days. But anyway, make MKV, there it is, it's installed. Next thing you're going to want is VLC player. This is what you will use for playing your media, whether or not you choose to process it with Make MKV or not. So we will get that going now. Uh-huh. Yep. And VLC player is free and it is always free. So this is just a passion project written by a group of people and they update it whenever they update it and blah blah blah. Um, I think there is a VLC organization you can like donate money to if you want, but the software itself is free. So finish, and let's not do that. Uh, updates is fine. Yep. So this is what you will use for playback. Now the thing you're going to need for actual decoding, or at least the way I like to do it, is any DVD. Any DVD is not free. I think it does have like a 30-day trial you will be buying it. Right now, since we're like Cyber Monday and stuff, there's probably a sale. There's almost always a sale. You know, so the bundle price, if you don't want a bundle, is about 109 euro. Or you can just do it a year at a time. I will warn you, there has been controversy before around any DVD. Because this type of software is only legal in certain places in the world, these guys have gotten into some trouble before, and they had to fold up shop. And when they reopened, they had no way of honoring the arrangements from the past. So that kind of thing can happen here too. You can pay your 82 euros or whatever and it's just money in the wind the next day. Who knows? This has been around for quite some time. It's working very well for me. So I don't have any big problem recommending it. Uh, but yeah, not free. You can see they offer a whole lot of different software that does a lot of other things that may or may not be okay where you live too. But for now, we will just download any DVD. There it is. Yep. I agree. I'm not a big fan of desktop icons, but that's up to you. Hey. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So we are going to request a trial. Okay. So we have a three week trial now to use. Yeah, and it's just going to kind of give us a walkthrough of things. So, really, if you just want to watch movies, any DVD is completely transparent to you. It'll just be down here in the system tray. Right there it is. 
and the little hover over is telling you what version it is, what drives are there, and how many are empty. So I'm going to put the greatest movie ever made in our drive, and any DVD should pop up and say it's scanning it. And there it is. It's saying it's checking it out. And it's untitled because I didn't author it very well, and as I have stated earlier, there is no copy protection on that disc. But now if we want to go play it, we just go over to VLC, Media, Open Disc. This happens to be a DVD, it is not in that drive, it is an E. So now we say play. And there actually is a menu here, DVD menus and Blu-ray menus aren't the same thing, just FYI. But if we wanted to, we could open that same disc again with no menus by just clicking that. Which means it'll just start straight into the chapter that it believes has the content on it. Welcome back to the channel. And it did. Today we're going to be talking about how to... Uh, another thing you can do, just FYI, you can geek out in the VLC preferences forever. And this will be a separate video on that I'm probably going to do on like configuring a home theater PC. It's kind of a ball of wax. But if you go to all settings and you look for DVD, you can tell it what to do with DVDs with menus. If you don't want to see all the previews and stuff on a movie that you've seen all the previews on 800 times already, you can tell it to just start directly in the menu. So that's what you saw the first time when we put the disc in, it popped up at the play menu. That's because of that option. If I had previews and stuff all up on this disc and I left it that way, that would show me all that stuff every time. The same thing exists for Blu-rays, and you're going to want to make sure this Blu-ray menu checkbox is not checked because we are not going to install Java. So what happens with a Blu-ray is as soon as you drop it in, it just starts playing the correct menu, or the correct chapter. 99% of the time anyway. So we'll go ahead and save my settings. If it doesn't, you can right click here, come down to playback, select chapter, perhaps title, oh! I can't do it on this disc because there's only one chapter. On most discs, would it have more than one chapter, you'd be able to come over here or, or more than one title on the disc and you'll be able to select that and just select the one that's the longest. That'll be the one to play. Again, apologize for the vagaries here, but 200 sets of laws in the world. It sucks. So that is how you play stuff. What everybody is going to want to do is know how to rip stuff. This is where things get particularly questionable. But I would say probably 99% of people are going to use MakeMKV to do it. I'm one of the 1% that doesn't care for that for a variety of reasons, but we'll get into a couple. When you get into MakeMKV, like any other software application, there's a whole bunch of options and things you can go through. But what most people do is they'll open the disk by just clicking that center button there. And it's going to come up with all the title information like subtitles and multiple tracks and all that good stuff. I absolutely hate doing it this way because there are some disc manufacturers, I think specifically Lionsgate is a studio that does it. I'll see if I can get a screen grab of one of the John Wick movies that'll have like a million fake chapters and stuff like that. And you have to look up forum posts or install Java or go through a whole bunch of other mechanisms to try and make your best guess at what things you want to click and what things you don't. like what audio tracks and all that stuff. It's just a big pain that I don't like dealing with. So if I were to want to use Make MKV, what I would do instead, and by the way, Make MKV KV does not want any DVD running most of the time, so you just right click on it and exit it if you want. But what I will do most of the time if I want to open something or make a copy with Make MKV, is I will just go to File and Backup. That gives you the entire disk, no matter what. I'm just gonna throw it in the desktop, say OK, since this happens to be a DVD, it's going to make a one-to-one -one ISO file copy of it. For whatever reason, MakeMKV will not do this with Blu-rays and 4K Blu-rays. It will only break them out into their folder structures, which is kind of a hassle. So if you want it as a single ISO file without having to go through a whole bunch of extra steps and stuff, you can't do it with MakeMKV. With DVDs you can, but with, not, but with everything else you can't. You can only make MKVs, which is kind of the, as the name implies, the idea, right? I like keeping the ISO because I can mount that as a disk image on any drive, which is a topic for another day. And 
I like doing it because it keeps it as a single file, which is not really something you get with the MKV. I mean, it is, but you have to reauthor it. And anyway, it's a hassle. So to play our ISO, use open VLC player and just boop, and there it is. Welcome back to the channel. Since that's a DVD with a menu and everything, it treats it just like a, a regular DVD disc with a menu and everything. If you had a Blu-ray or a 4K Blu-ray ISO sitting here, it would play exactly the same way. Um, I just personally, what I like to do is if I double click this, it'll say, what do you want to do? I just use VLC player as the default always. So now that file is associated to VLC forever. Double click it. Off you go. Welcome back to the channel. What I really like to do is I like to make ISO copies with any DVD. Just come down to the taskbar, right click any DVD, go to rip image. It's going to ask you, you know, what drives it in, which, you know, that one. You can select keep the copy protection, you know, if you happen to live somewhere where it's not allowed to, you know, break that copy protection. And then you just hit copy disk. Mm. Yeah, and it's going to complain, you sure you want to do this with a DVD? Yeah, I'm sure. And it's going to dump it in my documents when it's done. The nice thing is any DVD creates ISO files with everything. So with 4Ks, Blu-rays, all that stuff. So with like two clicks of the mouse, I can archive a disc with no thought whatsoever. And get all the bonus features and all the menus and all that stuff, whether or not they're sensible to use today. Like with Java, it's kind of, it kind of sucks, but hopefully the future will bring us something better. So now any DVD is done. It dumped it out into the documents folder, which is right here. Double click it. Welcome back to Go wrong, you could brick them. Just like we were with, with Make MKV. Again, I know 99% of people are going to want to use Make MKV to make their rips, but you can't use Make MKV just to play a disc, which is what a significant portion of my audience has asked me. Like, hey, I don't want to screw around with making rips and all that stuff. Well, any DVD and VLC player is what you want. And then you'll need Make MKV to support your Libre Drive. One word of note as relates to that combination, specifically with VLC player and expressly as relates to 4K discs, is basically the subtitles don't work. This kind of sucks. What it does is for some reason, with 4K discs, VLC player puts subtitles up as black text with black surround. So if you're watching anything other than like full screen 16 by 9, you know, like this 235 to 1 presentation where you get these black bars top and bottom, all the subtitles are going to be down here in this black and you won't be able to read them. It's not a perfect system. It is, you know, it is what it is. Like I said right from the start, if what you want is to do all this perfectly with no trouble, what you want is a set-top disc player. But if what you want is to preserve your media and then later on even tweak your media, which we'll get into during like the HTPC setup side of things, then making rips is definitely a good way to go. If you can do that where you live. So the long and short of things is that's how I like to do it. Any DVD, just click, 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 and you're done. It's super easy, but it's not the free way. So you have to weigh that out as you go along in your journey of how you like to do this stuff yourself. Speaking of preference for doing things, this is just the way I like to do it right now. There's every possibility in the future that I will like doing it some other way. There are some other ways that I would like to look into right now, as a matter of fact. I'm sticking with the direction I'm going right now primarily because of some of the features that VLC supports that we'll talk more about in an upcoming video. Another thing I'm doing that a lot of people will tell me I'm, I'm doing wrong is that I'm not recompressing any of the files whatsoever. So if a movie is like Interstellar, I think it's something like 90 gigs on disk. It's going to be 90 gigs on a hard drive too. That's pretty much fine with me. We're coming into the era where hard drives are now approaching about $10 a terabyte, or I expect to see that in the near future. In general, you can get 10 to 15 4K movies on a terabyte of storage. So that's what you're gonna be looking at as far as cost. It's also important to remember that there are only so many 4K titles in existence right now. I bet there's probably not even 10,000. Let's say that you have an interest in 10% of those and you're interested enough in 1% of those to actually buy them. You're talking about 100 movies. So it's really not such a big deal to just leave them full size. My main reason for doing that is to future-proof myself. As long as I have them in original quality, as full size as possible, I can do whatever I want with them later on. I'm going to be revisiting that with my CD collection before too long when I bring it all back in as a lossless format instead of when I originally encoded them as MP3. In 2005, when I started down that road, hard drives were prohibitively expensive per their size, per CD audio format size. 
but that quickly changed as well. You know, years and years ago that changed. So I'm just not gonna do that this time. I'm gonna go right from the beginning with what I wanted to do anyway. So speaking of what I wanna do, I should probably wrap this one up because I'm positive it's gonna be way too long as it is. So as always, I appreciate you stopping in to watch it and I'll catch you on the next one.